The scripture reading today is from Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 19. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and the Sadducees confronted them. They were incensed that the apostles were teaching the people and announcing that the resurrection of the dead was happening because of Jesus. They seized Peter and John and put them in prison until the next day. It was already evening. Many who heard the word became believers, and their number grew to about 5,000. The next day, the elders, the leaders, the elders, and legal experts gathered in Jerusalem along with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others from the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and asked, By what power or in what name did you do this? Then Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, answered, Leaders of the people and elders, are we being examined today because something good was done for a sick person, a good deed that healed him? If so, then you and all the people of Israel need to know that this man stands healthy before you because of the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone you builders rejected. He has become the cornerstone. Salvation can be found in no one else. Throughout the whole world, no other name has been given among humans through which we must be saved. The council was caught by surprise by the confidence with which Peter and John spoke. After all, they understood that these apostles were uneducated and inexperienced. They also recognized that they had been followers of Jesus. However, since the healed man was standing with Peter and John before their own eyes, they had no rebuttal. After ordering them to wait outside, the council members began to confer with each other, what should we do with these men? Everyone living in Jerusalem is aware of the sign performed through them. It's obvious to everyone, and we can't deny it. To keep it from spreading further among the people, we need to warn them not to speak to anyone in this name. When they called Peter and John back, they demanded that they stop all speaking and teaching in the name of Jesus. Peter and John responded, It's up to you to determine whether it's right before God to obey you rather than God. The word of the Lord. Take a moment now for silent reflection. Today, I'm so glad to welcome um, a guest, our guest preacher today, um, Emily Hansen Curran. Uh, she is the um, uh, founder of the Sunday Night Service, um, a ministry launched by uh, All Souls Episcopal Church, and so in Berkeley. Um, and uh, so, let us all just uh, give a hand of welcome uh, as we hear from her. I was told. There we go. Am I doing it? Oh yeah, I am. Okay. Uh, well, Elliot, friend, I am just your backup singer this morning, because, whew. Most of you uh, in this room don't know me, and you don't know my story, uh, but I live a life sort of unimaginable by my younger self. I grew up in the Assemblies of God, um, and later in college and on staff, as a four spiritual laws carrying campus crusader. Anybody else? Yes. I used to speak at women's retreats in college about my sin problem of homosexuality. I once voted against LGBTQ rights in my early adulthood, and I certainly, uh, unfortunately, wielded 
some Bible verses and the threat of hell against one of my closest friends when she came out to me post-college. I am many of my closest friends' first gay friend, and I certainly and most assuredly am the first openly gay person in the entire history of my family. And as a result, I have grown and learned to consider myself a queer person, someone who shows up to social events and by my mere presence makes some people very uncomfortable. When couples split at social events between men and women, whichever crowd I decide to go with has to shuffle around their dynamics to make space for me, or not. But a few months ago, I was reading a book about queer theory, and I came across the term homonormativity. Do you know this term? It's described by a professor of social and cultural analysis at NYU, Lisa Duggan, as a politics that does not contest dominant heteronormative assumptions and institutions, but upholds and sustains them while promising the possibility of a demobilized gay constituency and a privatized, depoliticized gay culture anchored in domesticity and consumption. The book went on to describe these heteronormative folks as sometimes normative-seeming LGBTQIA folks who might be more focused on domesticity and private rights than public or political ones. I looked at myself in the proverbial mirror and gulped. While I am certainly queer and I experience what it means to be queer in some really obvious ways, I can see parts of myself in this homonormativity and it's not where I want to be. It turns out I, the way I've been living has a name and a category even within queer theory, and it's not necessarily a good one. While I might be one of the few queers in my closest social circles, I have participated and benefited from heteronormative structures and assumptions. I have a wife, and we had a wedding, and now we have a four-year-old daughter and a German short-haired pointer named Scout who drives me crazy. We bought a house in Richmond. We planted a lawn this spring in our backyard. We have a ping pong table. Oftentimes, strangers ask me about my husband, and I don't correct them, but just keep on walking. These are not bad things. Some amount of safety and stasis is still a radical idea for a queer person. But I cannot and I should not put my trust in them. I believe it was the Spirit of God that brought me initially to question my straightness, but the Spirit of God does not rest there because the Spirit of God calls all of us to be queer. And that's where we're going to spend our time this morning. So then what does it mean to be queer? I mean, entire books have been written about describing what it means to be queer, but in short, it's that which questions or troubles the status quo or the binaries. It began, as many of you might remember, as a pejorative term used to refer to that which was abnormal or sick, odd or strange, which is how it was used initially to speak of people who deviated from the heterosexual norm. It wasn't until the late 1980s that the term began to be reclaimed by those who identified as different from the norm, often, most often, still sexually. But in the mid-90s, the term was applied for the first time more broadly as a theory that defined that which disrupted definition or fixed categorization, that which troubled fixed notions. It was, as my book, uh, Queer Theory Now, described not a theory of anything in particular, but constituted a range of academic and non-academic contexts and was animated by a desire to create publics that understand differences of privilege and structure and struggle. It operated and still does as a wish and a hope for a different kind of thinking and engagement with questions of sexuality, gender, identity, power, and the politics of oppression. Having been worked out for almost 30 years now, which is hard to believe, it has come to be that to, to refer to something as queer means to refer to that which resides in the liminal, 
which resists categorization, that which is disruptive to what is normative, that which questions what is. And so now we can turn to the story in Acts. Because I believe that when these early disciples, disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, they acted in ways that we would now describe as queer. It is this kind of queerness, in fact, that the Spirit of God draws us into as Christ followers. To be people who disrupt and trouble the systems and people who cause harm and brokenness in our world. And so in the story we just read this morning, Peter and John have just healed a man who was crippled and who had been, as a result, forced out of community and the provisions of community and was begging for money. Interestingly, the Greek for this word heal is sozo, which means to save, or better yet, to be delivered out of danger and into safety. So, like, let's just stop there for a brief second to note that if this is what we're talking about when we talk about saving people, we are talking about something very radical. We're not talking about saving souls. We're talking about the real work of delivering people out of danger and into safety. This is really important to keep in mind as we continue. So back to our main story. Jerusalem's highest authorities, Annas and his son Caiaphas, call these disciples in to question them about what power they invoked to rescue this man. Peter is clear and most importantly is said to be filled with the Holy Spirit when he retorts boldly that it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth who was crucified, a political reference you might remember, and raised from the dead that this healing and this saving work was done. Willie James Jennings does an excellent job of describing the dynamics at play in the Acts of the Apostles, and in this case, in Peter and John, in these two characters. He reminds us that these people are three things. One, people who live inside of empire. These are Jewish people living inside the Roman Empire and trying to survive and negotiate the dynamics of being a people group living under the power of another group. Two, they are people who live in diaspora, that is, people who live in exile, who don't have a place of full control that is theirs, and who live as a minority wherever they go. And third, these are people who are freshly learning and believing in their bodies what it means that the God that they have served now lives in and through them as a spirit rather than the flesh of Jesus. And these things matter because when we ask this text, as Willie James Jennings suggests that we do for every chapter of the book of Acts, what are the acts that are done? What we see is Peter, a person living within and under empire, as a minority, and in the unknown life filled with the Spirit of God, both liberating people and boldly disrupting and calling into question the chain of political authority. Peter and John understood themselves as people who, in the words of Jennings, and I'm only mildly sorry about repeating his name so many times, unrelentingly call into question the gods of their age. They pay attention to those on the margins and liberate those who have been broken by the systems that oppress. And in this boldness and in their boldness to do it, they call into question those who support and are at ease with the systems that break people. And this will get you into trouble, friends. It's why Peter and John are thrown into prison overnight. But it's also why their numbers are growing wildly. Because when we act out of the Spirit of God, who is calling us all to be queer, to disrupt the status quo and to agitate boundaries and binaries, people are set free. And though it's terrifying, because it's still today often criminalized, people show up for that. Not always in droves, like we see told in this story, in part because I think sometimes it is too dangerous. But that kind of visibility matters to people. Think of the work of Rachel Held Evans and Nadia Boltz-Weber in, in, the, in the more conservative, evolving faith world. Or out in the secular world, a queer icon like Laverne Cox. 
I'm not sure that she claims the Spirit of God at work in her, but I'm also not sure that matters to the Spirit of God. When people are liberated or even inspired to be liberated and restored to community with their full selves, I believe God is at work. And this is the work that we're all called to be and to do. When has someone else liberated you to move into the unknown ahead? Or when have you acted with boldness and courage and then been told later that you paved the way way for another? And if you haven't, you might want to question the Spirit of God in your life. I didn't print that down, I just said that right now because I feel like it's true. But there's an idea in queer theory that it is, in fact, already dead. These ideas started to come out about a decade after queer theory was introduced as a broad theory. And as what was deemed queer became more mainstream, it started to seem that if everyone is queer, then no one is queer. And while this trend might have been specifically true, the critique that queer theory is dead makes a massively optimistic assumption about our human nature and tendencies. It assumes that we will somehow stop enacting power over people and drawing binaries that oppress. That we will somehow stop hoarding wealth over others while some have none. That we will stop dominating others by normalizing certain behaviors. In other words, and specifically Christian words, it makes the assumption that sin and evil are no more. But as long as we're here, there will always be sin. There will be new categorizations and a status quo which need to be defied, and people for whom liberation from these categories and status quo will be necessary for their healing. That is to say that just as we think we've arrived, the Spirit calls us again and again. Because we as humans will always try to institutionalize and categorize, even when it's for good. Think of Peter in the Transfiguration trying to pitch a tent for a ghost. But the Spirit is restless, hovering, agitating our hearts as Christ followers to embrace the disruptive queerness of the Spirit and work boldly towards that which heals what has been broken. To return to where we started, the work of the Spirit may have led me to come out Uh, 13 years ago, that does not mean that that is where I stop. If I believe that the spirit is alive and cannot die, in the same way I believe that queer theory cannot die, then I must remain open to the spirit leading me to the edges of what I think I know. And so as a way to close, I feel especially given this pride season that y'all are honoring here, but there's just a few things I want to say very directly so that, as to make sure they get said. The first thing is that if you are in this room or are listening in and you consider yourself LGBTQIA, that might be all the queerness of the spirit you can handle right now. <laughs> there is an inherent queerness about the way you have to live in this world. I'm thinking specifically about like the idea of queer time and the idea that being queer, and and in this way I mean identifying as LGBTQIA, often means that you live out of sync with what is often considered normatively the good life, and the ways in which heteronormative folks impose their temporality as the norm. This is just one example, but that's just to say that it's not always easy to find your way into yourself when you identify in the world as LGBTQ. Elliot gave us an excellent testimony of that very thing. And perhaps sometimes you just need to stay where you are and be safe for a while. Get your lawn and your ping pong table. But the second thing I want to make sure gets said plainly is something I mentioned earlier about my own learning about the word queer, which is that just because someone is gay does not mean that they are queer. This is especially crucial right now in our country. I think of a meme that the race and social uh, justice educator Erica Hart posted the other day that says simply, for Pride Month this year, can straight people focus less on love is love? 
and more on queer and trans people are in danger. I don't think I'd be overstepping to say that I think she would also be fine if we changed straight to maybe just cisgender. People who identify as queer and non-binary and trans are specifically under threat by the powers of the empire we live under and within. It is our job, those of us who are cisgender or straight or gay, to step out into our own unknowns and pave the way so these people can be safe. The final thing I want to say plainly, and which I hope I have communicated already, is that queerness is much bigger than sexuality. And it is here that I find the good news of Jesus Christ. Queerness is the call of the Spirit of God. When we live by this Spirit, we will be disruptors, and we will experience disruption. We will find ourselves questioning the status quo, seeking, subverting, and unsettling structures that dominate and oppress others. And as we stand up with the boldness of that same spirit that Peter and John invoked, we will see people healed and saved and rescued into safety. So let us pray. Holy Spirit, make us bold to be queer. Fill us with the courage of these early disciples to venture into the wilderness of boundaries and binaries, of structures, of power, and all the normativity that try to tell us how to live apart from you. Stir up in us the courage to challenge the gods of our age, and all for your love's sake. Amen. Mm -hmm.